The 1986 accident at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in today's Ukraine was undoubtedly the worst nuclear disaster in history. To put things into perspective, this incident released more than 400 times as much radioactive material as the atomic bomb that devastated Hiroshima in 1945. The Chernobyl disaster claimed 30 lives directly, and according to many experts, thousands indirectly. The once vibrant town of Pripyat, located near the ill-fated power plant, was evacuated transforming it into a ghost town in less than 36 hours. How could a disaster of this magnitude have ever happened? On the surface, the Chernobyl disaster was the product of a remarkable range of human errors and specific reactor features which compounded and amplified the effects of errors. As the 1986 summary report on the post-accident review meeting on the Chernobyl accident put it, in simpler terms, mistakes made by plant operators and a flawed reactor design were to blame for this unprecedented disaster. But is that all there is to it? Given the enormity of the Chernobyl disaster and its far-reaching consequences, it's easy to understand the answer to this question is no. Look at it this way. Every war has its immediate and underlying cause. Take World War I as an example. The assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand was the immediate cause of the devastating war. But beneath the surface, an intricate web of alliances, nationalism, and militarism fueled the flame. Similar complexities underlie the Chernobyl disaster. Sure, human error and poor reactor design caused the infamous reactor number 4 to explode, but it was a systemic failure in the Soviet nuclear program's management that turned Chernobyl into a ticking time bomb. Essentially, it was a culture of secrecy, a lack of transparency, and inadequate safety protocols that ultimately ignited the catastrophic nuclear flame, not just technical shortcomings. So when exploring the causes behind the largest nuclear disaster in history, we'll look at every component of this lethal mix. Let's start with the underlying causes. Though many people, primarily Soviets, blamed the Chernobyl disaster on the operator's recklessness and lack of competence, their actions on that fateful April night were, above all, a direct reflection of the prevailing safety culture of the Soviet era, or, to be precise, a lack of safety culture. You see, despite being one of the world leaders in nuclear technology, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics failed to implement and prioritize adequate safety practices for the technology. At best, these practices can be described as limited, while calling the Soviet approach to safety lax might even be a compliment. But let's dig a little deeper. How did this lack of safety culture enable the Chernobyl disaster? For starters, Soviet safety policies never accounted for a catastrophe of such magnitude. When creating the policies, Soviet decision makers only factored in so-called realistic scenarios. This is on par with designers behind the reactors used in the Chernobyl power plant who didn't consider catastrophic scenarios when determining the most extreme malfunction these reactors should be able to cope with, or the so-called Maximum Design Accident, or MDA. They had no interest in those only remotely possible scenarios, leaving the Soviet power plants ill-equipped to handle them. For instance, a Soviet power plant could generally handle an isolated break in the largest coolant-carrying pipe. But something like the reactor core melting was dismissed as virtually impossible and thus not covered by any safety protocols. Also, the reactor's operating reactivity margin, or ORM, was only seen as a way to control the reactor power and not as a crucial safety parameter. And let's not forget the complete lack of any safety features in the plant, such as concrete containment and water moderators. Interestingly, the Soviets believed that the approach increased the overall safety of their power plants. That might seem counterintuitive, but here's how they saw it. Too many unnecessary backup systems can only lead to operational complexities, thus decreasing overall safety. While this explanation might seem somewhat rational, the events that transpired during the Chernobyl disaster clearly exposed a fatal flaw of this perspective. Now, you might wonder, is it possible that no one in the USSR saw how tragically flawed this perspective was? To answer the question, we must first examine how the Soviets approached monitoring, reporting, and overall transparency, especially in the nuclear sector. Recognizing the potential power of the sector, the USSR heavily invested in the development of nuclear power facilities. The development of these facilities was followed by organizations tasked with supervising their safety. So far, so good, isn't it? Well, not quite. You see, the primary organization tasked with this role was Gosarum Energo Nadzor, the State Committee for the Supervision of Nuclear Power Safety. But this organization wasn't independent. Instead, it operated within the framework of established Soviet bureaucratic entities in charge of power production. In other words, these so-called supervisors were actually subordinates of their supervisees. With this in mind, 
it shouldn't be surprising that no red flags were raised surrounding the neglect of the existing nuclear equipment or any potential mistakes in its management. The supervisors of the Chernobyl power plant and every other Soviet establishment simply behaved as most Soviets at the time. They feared authority and did their best to please the political superiors. This compliance-driven culture is what prevented the operators concerned about the safety of the test that would lead to the Chernobyl disaster from voicing their concerns and alerting their superiors. Of course, such poor reporting was nothing new for the Soviets. They boasted about not experiencing a single major failure with their reactors in the late 1970s, but the evidence suggests otherwise. Though there are few details, no surprise there, it appears that the USSR had experienced at least five major reactor incidents preceding the Chernobyl disaster. In 1974, a coolant loop ruptured in a Leningrad nuclear power station, killing three individuals and spilling highly radioactive water into the environment. Just three years later, half the fuel assemblies in the Beloyarsk nuclear power plant melted, exposing the operators to severe radiation. Another accident occurred in 1985, when human error caused a safety valve to explode at Balakovo nuclear power plant, killing 14 people. Believe it or not, we have yet to cover the worst Chernobyl disaster precursor incidents. The first of the two most alarming accidents preceding the Chernobyl disaster happened in 1957 when a waste storage tank at the Mayak Production Association, a nuclear weapons production site, exploded. Though this disaster claimed no lives directly, it caused numerous radiation-related illnesses and cancers in tens of thousands of people living nearby. The Mayak disaster is one of the worst nuclear incidents in history, ranking second by radioactivity released. The only disaster that released more radioactivity was the Chernobyl disaster itself. Yet, chances are this is the first time you hear of the Mayak disaster. Why? Well, the answer is simple. Secrecy, secrecy, and also some more secrecy. Not even the residents in the affected areas were initially informed about the incident. Instead, they were simply evacuated without any explanation. It would take 18 years for the world to learn the true extent of the disaster. If this weren't the case, perhaps the Soviets would have adequately prepared for the Chernobyl disaster. But there's no point in playing this woulda, coulda, shoulda game with an accident that happened some 1,500 miles away and 29 years before the Chernobyl disaster of 1986. Especially given an incident taking place just four years prior at the same plant wasn't enough to break the chains of secrecy. That's right, the 1986 disaster wasn't the first serious incident at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. In 1982, during a trial run for a scheduled reactor shutdown, one of the pressure channels broke and released radiation into the reactor compartment. Major General Valkulenko, who reported on the incident, stated that repairing the broken channel would take five days and emphasized there was no high radioactive contamination at the premises. However, a secret report would later show that contamination had actually reached an area of as many as nine miles surrounding the power plant. Hiding these accidents from the Soviet public and the foreign observers was bad enough, but in most cases they were also hidden from other nuclear power personnel. This astonishing lack of transparency prevented shared learning that could have led to an improvement in engineering and procedural flaws. Now you might think that once the Chernobyl disaster struck, this secrecy went out the window, and the Soviets did everything in their power to mitigate the consequences as quickly as possible. Unfortunately, you'd be very wrong. The immediate aftermath of the Chernobyl disaster revealed a continuation of the same old patterns. Downplay the severity of the incident. Delegate any important decisions up the chain of command. Wait for bureaucratic processes to unfold. Repeat. Even though the tests performed in Pripyat within hours of the explosion showed alarmingly high levels of radioactivity, 4.5 Röntgen per day to be precise, no evacuation was ordered. This order would come more than 34 hours after the incident when the levels of radiation reach 600 milliroentgens per hour. To better understand that figure, think of it this way. The Pripyat residents were subjected to a full-body CT scan every hour. Compounding the issue, these poor residents were given only an hour and a half to pack their belongings and evacuate. Had this decision been made sooner, the Pripyat residents wouldn't have been exposed to so much radiation, which eventually led to thyroid cancer in many individuals, primarily children. Paradoxically, the Chernobyl disaster occurred while the last leader of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev, was attempting to reform the country through two primary policies, Glasnost and Perestroika. You'll immediately understand what's paradoxical about this once you learn that Glasnost focused on increasing transparency and openness within the Soviet governmental system, promising better communication between the authorities and the public. 
Surprising to no one, this communication was nowhere to be seen in the aftermath of Chernobyl, demonstrating that nothing truly changed within the Union. As always, the government cowered and remained silent at first and then took the deny-deny-deny route. While addressing the Chernobyl disaster for the first time on TV, May 14, 1986, Gorbachev slammed international reports on this incident as malicious lies. However, this time the Soviet public didn't fall for this, leading to widespread distrust. Eventually, the policies that were meant to save the Soviet Union failed, taking the entire Union with them. With this in mind, it became clear why Gorbachev cited Chernobyl as the real cause of the collapse of the Soviet Union. But let's not dive too deep into the aftermath of the Chernobyl disaster just yet. Sure, we've covered all the primary underlying causes of this catastrophic event so far, but we're yet to explore the immediate causes of the world's largest nuclear disaster. As already mentioned, there were two of them, poor reactor design and human error. Though these factors should never be discussed in isolation, it's important to recognize them as major elements in causing the Chernobyl disaster. As far as reactors go, one thing was abundantly clear to anyone who came into contact with these Soviet creations. The RBMK reactors used at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant were inherently unsafe. There were several reasons for this. Firstly, as previously explained, these reactors weren't investigated by any independent safety bodies. If competent, independent experts were allowed to inspect these reactors, they would likely raise two red flags, the physical characteristics that prompted them to act unstable and the complete and total lack of efficient safety systems. Both of these can be explained by the fact that the USSR started their nuclear power program behind other developed nations and tried to catch up by any means necessary. This also meant completely ignoring the human factor when designing the reactors. As you can imagine, this led to nothing good. The RBMK reactors had a unique design that combined graphite as a moderator instead of water and a water coolant. Graphite was used because it was cost-effective yet allowed for significantly higher energy output. However, graphite is also quite unpredictable. In water-moderated reactors, water will become less effective in facilitating a reaction as it gets hotter. Graphite, on the other hand, will keep promoting the reaction even if the temperature escalates. The only way to put a stop to the reaction is to lower boron carbide control rods into the reactor. The more control rods go in, the more effectively the reaction is controlled. But as the Chernobyl disaster showed, this design characteristic was widely unsafe. As you'll soon learn, once the control rods were lowered during the Chernobyl disaster, they jammed. But the trouble lay in their graphite tips, which not only prevented the boron in the control rods from slowing the reaction, but actually contributed to a surge in reactivity. The water cooling system further exacerbated the situation and ultimately caused the explosion in the reactor. But it's still not time to discuss the human errors that led to the system activating, not when there are more unsafe characteristics of the RBMK reactors to break down. Another crucial feature of these reactors that proved to be highly unsafe was the positive void coefficient. This coefficient is what predominantly contributed to the overall power coefficient in the RBMK reactors. What is the positive void coefficient? The positive void coefficient refers to the reactor's response to the formation of voids and steam bubbles in the coolant. In traditional reactor designs used in the West, an increase in voids tends to reduce reactivity, thus acting as a self-regulating mechanism. However, in the RBMK reactors, reactivity increases as voids or steam bubbles form, which is precisely what happened during the Chernobyl disaster. The rapid rise in reactivity exacerbated the uncontrollable chain reaction, contributing to the severity of the catastrophe. However, the lack of a proper containment structure made this event even more disastrous. In the West, this structure comes in the form of a concrete and steel dome located over the reactor and designed to keep the radiation inside the power plant in the event of an accident. The radiation shield used for the RBMK reactors wasn't enough to contain the release of radioactive materials after the reactor number 4 exploded leading to elements like plutonium, strontium, and iodine being dispersed over a wide area. But where do the power plant operators fit in this narrative? To understand why human error was first identified as the culprit for the Chernobyl disaster, let's look at what precisely happened on April 26, 1986, explaining where the power plant operators went wrong. The trouble started on April 25th, when the fourth reactor was to shut down for routine maintenance. The reactor crew at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant decided to take advantage of the shutdown to determine how the reactor would behave following the loss of station power. Their goal was to establish whether the slowing turbine would produce enough electrical power 
to sustain the reactor's safety systems until the emergency power supply kicked in. This test had already been attempted a year prior, but the energy from the turbine was insufficient to keep the safety systems running. That's why the crew decided to repeat the test using newly developed voltage regulators. Unfortunately, the team conducting the test didn't consult the personnel in charge of the safety of the nuclear reactor, which proved to be the fatal mistake. Here's how the operators put reactor number 4 in a dangerously unstable condition, which essentially guaranteed an accident. The reactor shutdown commenced on April 25th at 1.06 am by gradually lowering the power level. This process was halted at 3.47 am as the electrical load dispatcher insisted on maintaining a minimum power level for grid stability. At 2 pm, the operator shut off the reactor's emergency core cooling system to prevent it from interrupting the test. Though this move didn't contribute to the accident, leaving the system on could have at least slightly reduced its impact. Over nine hours would pass before the grid controller agreed to recommence the power reduction. This took place at 11.10 pm, followed by a shift change at midnight. Here's where the real trouble started. Only half an hour after midnight, the power rapidly dropped to 30 megawatts thermal. To understand just how bad this is, you should know that the operation of the reactor below 700 megawatts thermal was strictly forbidden. This sudden drop was likely due to operational error. Either the operator failed to give the hold power at required level signal, or the system failed to respond to such a signal. The operators tried to increase the power to an acceptable level but were met with several challenges, including xenon poisoning and reduced coolant void. To respond to these challenges, the operators withdrew numerous power rods thus violating the minimum operating reactivity margin, or ORM, of 15 rods. However, this move did result in stabilizing the reactor at about 200 megawatts thermal by 1 am, which encouraged the operators to proceed with the test. The test commenced at approximately 1.23 am, but only after the operators made a few more mistakes. For instance, they enabled additional cooling pumps around 1.07 am, which caused them to remove more rods to prevent power levels from falling. According to some calculations, only 8 rods were left inside the reactor, and if you remember, the minimum ORM required is at least 15. Once the test started, it took about 40 seconds before things started getting terribly wrong. At 1.23 am and 40 seconds, an operator pressed the emergency AZ-5 button, lowering all of the control rods into the reactor's core, intending to shut down the reactor. Some believe that this move was what caused the sudden power excursion. It took only 3 seconds for the power to reach 530 megawatts thermal, showing no signs of slowing down. This caused fuel elements to rupture, increasing steam generation and further boosting power due to a large positive void coefficient. And let's remember the Soviet reactors only accounted for an isolated element breaking down. At this point, several fuel channels ruptured, increasing the pressure in the reactor. This pressure was so great that the reactor's radiation shield, a 1000 ton support plate, detached causing the control rods to jam about halfway down into the reactor. And then, complete and utter chaos. The emergency cooling circuit ruptured, feeding water into the core and causing intense steam generation. Here's when the first explosion took place. Another explosion ensued just two to three seconds later, likely caused by the buildup of hydrogen from zirconium steam reactions. The second explosion threw out fuel and hot graphite, starting a number of fires. By the end of these explosions, the reactor's core was completely exposed to the atmosphere. The core continued to burn for days after the accident, releasing radioactive particles into the environment. In an effort to extinguish the blaze, helicopters dropped some 5,000 tons of sand, clay, lead, boron, and dolomite onto the core for almost 10 days straight. About 300 tons of water was also injected per hour into the intact half of the reactor. But these efforts were soon stopped out of fear of flooding reactors number 1 and 2. Eventually, the remains of the reactor number 4 were encased in a hastily constructed concrete and steel structure known as the sarcophagus. Given how fast it was built, it shouldn't be surprising that this structure significantly deteriorated over the years, calling for several repairs. However, the ultimate plan under the Shelter Implementation Plan project by the Chernobyl Shelter Fund was to build a new, more secure and permanent structure around the existing one. The structure called the New Safe Containment NSC, was completed in 2017, spanning over 850 feet. But what happened to the people and the environment surrounding the Chernobyl nuclear power plant throughout all those years? Though this video primarily focuses on the causes of the Chernobyl disaster, this catastrophe can't possibly be discussed without mentioning the terrible aftermath. 
As previously mentioned, the disaster claimed 30 lives directly. Two of them were power plant workers who died as a result of the initial explosion in the reactor. The rest of the casualties were firefighters and emergency cleanup workers who mostly died from acute radiation syndrome ARS, in the first three months after the accident. They were exposed to up to 20,000 milligrays of radiation in the aftermath of the Chernobyl disaster. To understand just how high that is, you should know that ARS occurs when an individual is exposed to more than 700 milligrays of radiation. This makes such a high dose of radiation 100% fatal. But what about the residents in the affected areas? How did the radiation affect them? Well, for starters, the entire town of Pripyat, a little over 49,000 residents, was evacuated 36 hours after the accident. The evacuations continued in the subsequent weeks and months, resulting in around 200,000 people being resettled into less contaminated areas. The Chernobyl disaster took a severe toll on the physical and mental health of the affected residents. As far as physical health goes, there were at least 1,800 documented cases of thyroid cancer in children following the accident. In the mental health department, the worst consequence was the instances of suicide among the affected population. Tragically, this population also includes Valery Lagasov, the Soviet chemist who played a key role in the initial response to the Chernobyl disaster. Legasov hanged himself in his Moscow apartment the day after the second anniversary of the disaster and a day before he was supposed to present the findings of his investigation into the causes of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant accident. Having learned the causes of this terrible accident in this video, you can probably understand why the weight of such knowledge, combined with the broader impact on public health and the environment, took a heavy toll on individuals like Valery Legasov. But what do you think about the causes of the Chernobyl disaster? Do you think there was any way to avoid such a catastrophic event? Share your opinion in the comment section below, then check out what happened immediately after the Chernobyl disaster, or watch this video instead.